People talk about AI and so on, and I try to point out, like, that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're going to have all kinds of stuff that are so much harder to think about than AI that are hybrids and cyborgs and augmented humans. You know, you think right now some people are neurodivergent. You wait and see till they till they have, you know, crazy chips in their heads and, you know, wheels and, and, and you know, uh, tentacles and whatnot. This is not a thousand years from now. This is a decade, like in the next decades. I mean, the, the, the impulse I have is to pick up a megaphone and travel the world <laughs> uh, announcing this. <laughs> Good afternoon, good evening. Hi, Michael. Hey, Bernardo, how are you? Good, good to see you again. Yeah, great to see you. I am here. Hey, Bernardo, great to have you back. Especially at uh, 10 p.m. your time, is that true? Yes, it's 10 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> the day yeah. is still young. <laughs> <laughs> You're a night owl. I am, yes. I can okay. easily go to 4 a.m. working, no problem. Oh, Whoa. really? Okay. Whoa. Yeah, but in the morning, I'm wasted. I'm worth nothing. <laughs> okay, well, that's amazing. That's assuage any guilt I had about setting it up for what, for what you was quite early. Uh, late, I mean. Uh, I'm more of an early bird, so if I'm a bit um, incoherent at any point, then do forgive me. <laughs> um, yeah, and welcome, everyone. Feel free, as always. It's fun if you put in the chat where you're joining from. Um, and... Uh, if there's time, we'll also get to questions that you put in the chat. And just repeating, just deep gratitude, both Bernardo and Michael. I know that it's a bit of a stretch to find moments in your schedule where you could both meet, which is why we're meeting a quite unusual time a couple of days before Christmas uh, on what in Europe is a Friday night. Um, and we promised you, Michael, that we would start with the questions that you had, if you, if you want. I think around memory or something that you had a couple things for Bernardo, and then we've got some prepared questions as well, depending on how that goes. Great. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for having me back. Um, and uh, uh, I have I have two two questions. Let's let's start with this. Um, so uh, so I was I was uh, listening to a uh, a dialogue between uh, Bernardo and Rupert Spira, and it was uh, super interesting. And one of the ideas that uh, that they were discussing is that. Uh, our minds are basically uh, fragmented altars of a, of a of a larger initial collective intelligence. Yeah? And and I find that I find that um, very very plausible and 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 very uh, you know very reasonable. Um, but my question is this, and you can tell me if if this is a crazy question or not. Oftentimes, uh, these kind of um, altars show up as a result of a of a very specific and intense stress. Right, they show up from from some sort of um, uh, an event, a traumatic event that causes the uh, the 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 larger scale self to to fragment into small. And so I wonder, do you think that um, that is where we come from, or what what is the event uh, that uh, that caused this? Or or maybe it's not a time. You know, you 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 tell me what you think. But but I was just wondering, like, what could the event be that caused that initial fragmentation? The honest answer from my side is I, I don't know, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Who can know? I, I, I can only speculate. Um, I have a, a friend, uh, John Horgan, a journalist, um, mm -hmm. used to be a journalist for, for Scientific American. And uh, the, this question is very big on his mind. Like, did mm -hmm. God go crazy? And then here mm -hmm. we are. Is that how, how it happened? Um, I, I would share with you my... my, my safe answer and my safe answer is obviously dissociation can happen in nature we see it happen and if something can happen in nature given enough time it's bound to happen mm. so there may not have been uh, a specific uh, catalyzing event uh, it perhaps it's more profitable for us to think of that first dissociation, just as we think of a biogenesis, um, perhaps a amazing accident, but given enough time, it was it was bound to happen. You know, circumstances mm -hmm. would be constellated eventually. Yeah. It was bound to lead to that, and then and then natural selection kicks in, and the thing persists uh, by maintaining a sort of thermodynamical equilibrium and and reproducing. Mm -hmm. So this would be my safe answer. Do I believe it? 
well, if you would put me against a wall with a gun to my head and said, if you get this wrong, I'm going to shoot you, that's the answer I would have, I, I would give. Uh, so it's not just my PR answer. It, it's really my safe answer. But if I allow myself to speculate and, you know, make use of my own, you know, psychedelic trips that I used to do some several years ago as a sort of a, a personal research program, I did it very seriously. Um, then there is this experience I once had, and more than once actually, it sort of stays with you and can come from the left field even when you are in a hypnagogic state or hypnopompic state, it comes and hits you, uh, which I call uh, the vertigo of eternity. Um, confronting not the concept, the idea, this little toy of eternity that we talk about, but confronting the reality of eternity and, and the absence of um, diversity uh, is a nuclear bomb for your emotional system. And I can imagine that that if a little spark of metacognition happened at some point in, you know, in, the, in the history of mind at large um, that allowed that experience to be had, uh, I could imagine that the tremendous emotional trigger that would make all kinds of organizing principles in mind sort of kick in mm -hmm. and and to, to preserve the integrity of of whatever mental processes were were going on in other words trauma of some sort a, a kind of self-induced trauma the reason i don't bet on it is that uh, we don't seem to have self-induced traumas traumas are always something that comes from the outside um, and in the case of the mind that, of nature, there is nothing outside. So I, I, I struggle with this idea a little bit, but I can see that some people can trace it back to their own sort of transcendent, you know, you go to solution experiences in which they confront this reality of unity and eternity. And it can be, it, it, it can be cataclysmic for, for your mental health. Uh, uh, I, I know that. So it is not completely unreasonable to speculate that something like that could have happened if a spark of a metacognition arose by chance in the mind of nature. Mm. But but the honest answer again is, I, I, I don't know, Michael, that it yeah. did happen, it did, right? Life is here, here we are, I can't read your thoughts, presumably you can't read mine. So it happened. Uh, and it only needed to have happened maybe a couple of times, like abiogenesis, until it happened in, in a way that the process could maintain itself. And then evolution kicks in, natural selection, and then and then we have a, a you know, out of jail card. Uh, we only need to make sense of those initial moments of abiogenesis, those initial moments of dissociation. And that's difficult because they are so far back. Yeah. Very, yeah, very interesting. Uh, you know, part of... Um... So, so as I think about the, uh, the, the biological version of this, uh, in the initial early embryo, when you have a blastoderm of the tens of thousands of cells, if, if they were to all stay connected, you couldn't actually form any kind of a structure with it. You wouldn't have an embryo. You would have a, you would have a plain field of cells. It would be very boring. Nothing would actually happen. And so, right. Part of what enables all the interesting things to happen is that you actually draw boundaries between regions that are uh, in an important way, not, not completely, but in important informational ways, isolated from other areas, you make compartments and these compartments become other organs and the, they compete during development and they cooperate and they do all kinds of interesting things. And so, you know, I wonder to what extent that fragmentation is actually a solution to to some amount of boredom, uh, that so to speak, right? That if everything is just completely uniform and identical, there's very limited things that are going to happen. But 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 for a variety of experience and and in biology, it ends up you know f f functional. Uh, you need you need barriers uh, to form, and you need certain cells not to know what their neighbors are doing. Otherwise, if they know everything and they share exactly the same memories, then you're not going to have rich structure, right? So yeah. So well, that is interesting. Uh, yeah. my, my gut reaction would be, well, in the case of life, there are very good evolutionary reasons why there should be internal dissociations, right? I mean, just think about how difficult it would be if you were to try to take deliberate, egoic control of every muscle movement you make when you're riding a bike. Hmm. It wouldn't take very long at all for you to decide that it's better to, have, to leave those <laughs> on their, for their own devices and not meddle with that. The same thing for heartbeat. Uh, if we would need deliberate conscious control of 
the movements of the heart, that would be evolutionarily catastrophic uh, because it's something that has to happen all the time. Liver fun function, kidney function. There is one, and that's because we are mammals and mammals are strange in that way. There is one autonomous function that can drift into the liberate space and that's breathing. And no, the, the, luckily there is that, otherwise there would be no dolphins and whales, right? If they couldn't deliberately control their breathing, they would drown in no time. Um, we perhaps don't really need it, but for some reason we have that. So we can experience both sides, what it is to take deliberate control of your breathing and what it is to, to leave it dissociated, leave it for its own, uh, on its own devices. Um, so for biology, I, I would resist the idea that... Um, this formation of internal hierarchical dissociative boundaries are because of some kind of feeling like boredom. I mean, I, 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 I guess you would agree with me here. You probably didn't mean that, that, uh, that it isn't encoded by, you know, in the genes that that must happen. No, no, no. I, when, I, when I said boredom, I was uh, sort of uh, extrapolating to the oh, grand uh, universal consciousness, right? So, you know, just thinking about you're hanging out by yourself and you're like, well, this is somewhat boring. Let's... Uh, you know, let's uh, spice things up by fragmenting into areas that allow us uh, some some structure. Um, it's funny the breathing thing that you mentioned. I actually, we, weirdly enough, I had this this year, uh, probably four or five months ago. I had a bout of um, about thirty six hours where my breathing was exclusively voluntary, and it was uh, it was absolutely horrible. Uh, it was it was crazy because every time you go to sleep, you just realize you stop breathing, and uh, you you learn very quickly the value of having an automated. Uh, you know, yeah. automated breathing apparatus. Yeah. Um, if you if you open the gate for a kind of endogenous experience to have motivated the first dissociation of abiogenesis, uh, then I would then I would line up more with a traumatic experience than just boredom. Mm -hmm. Unless the boredom is so extreme that it uh, leads to a traumatic experience, mm -hmm. which which could could be it could be. I mean, we mm -hmm. anthropomorphizing too much. So, at that level, it could be cosmic could be. boredom could be catastrophic emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Well, okay. And then the other question, so this is less of a specific question, but these are just some notes I had at the end of where we ended last time. And, and I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't know where, where this was going, but you, we had started talking about um, the nature of memory and the, and the aspect of reconstruction. Right, so so the kind of uh, active dynamic reconstruction of memory. So I just wanted to to hear what um, what you had to say about it. About memory. Well, and, and and specifically, you mentioned reconstruction, which I'm very interested in because of uh, some of the experiments we've done and so on. So this idea of of memory as a um, uh, an actively constructed, uh, you know, whatever whatever it is. Um, yeah, I just wanted to see what what you had to say about it. So again, speculative, and the honest answer. Is... Along with everybody else, I don't know what memories really are. Yeah. And uh, you are largely responsible for my admitting that because after your planary experiment, right. you know, it's just like, okay, then we are back to square one and we have to rethink the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'll share with you my intuitions and early thoughts, but it, they are not really conclusive. And we just had a conference organized by Essential Foundation a couple of weeks ago, and the theme was time and mind. Mm. And we had a bunch of physicists like Lise Molin and a few Paul Davis and a few big mm. guns and a few big gun psychologists. And, um, and, and it's amazing how there is absolutely no consensus about the nature of time. People are all over the place and all their views are reasonable and, and they're not crazy. So which shows that the question is up for grabs the nature of time and therefore the nature of space. So in that environment, I am with Kant and Schopenhauer that uh, space-time or extension dimension, these are cognitive scales. They are the scales of the dials on our dashboard. The space and time is not out there. It's not an objective scaffolding of the, the real states of the world out there. Uh, which, of course, is allowed by idealism because idealism allows for the real world to be constituted of mental states. And mental states don't need extension to have structure. You know, uh, cognitive associations, uh, uh, relations of similarity, they can exist independent of extension because you don't need extension to characterize endogenous mental states. How long in centimeters is my thought? What is the weight in kilograms of my emotion? And it, it, this stuff doesn't play. Um, so I think extension is 
a thing on our dashboard. Space and time is something we create to organize the data we have about nature, to avoid cognitive overload or to avoid not being able to pick out what is salient uh, to our survival and, and, and continuance uh, um, regarding the world around you. If that is the case, then our lack of access to the past uh, is something self-imposed. It's imposed by our cognitive system. I don't mean egoically self-imposed. I don't mm -hmm. think you can wish your way out of it, just mm -hmm. as you cannot wish your way out of your humanity. That's how we are put together. Uh, but nonetheless, it's something imposed by how we are put together. Um, um, so in that sense, you could say in physics, this is close to the idea of the block universe. Mm. All states exist, and it's only access that uh, that creates this illusion of a past that is gone and a future that is yet to be. Um, so in my view, and sorry for the long introduction, but in my view, the metaphor of memories as little computer files whose states are copies of real states in the past, and those real states in the past are no longer there. They have ontologically disappeared. And all you have is a copy of those states in a little computer file somewhere in your head. That metaphor of you know, memories being copy states, I think it doesn't hold water much based on you know, your work and the work of several uh, other people and you know, the work in philosophy about is time real or not. I think a better metaphor is to think of memories as a way in which we bypass our own cognitive filters, which impose the difference between past, future, and, and, and present in the first place. Mm. Mm. So if, that, if the inaccessibility of the past is something imposed by our cognitive system, then our cogniz cognitive system can relax that filtering when it's useful. You see? So I, I think ultimately memory is an access to the past and, and, and the past is there and it will always be there. And so is the future. And it's just we that traverse it through a little slit uh, to avoid cognitive overload. And when it's evolutionarily useful that we sort of relax the filters, we impose ourselves. That's memory. Um, that doesn't mean that memories are perfect, because that's the criti critique I get immediately from people like, well, if memories are direct access to the past, how can we misremember a thing? Well, the way to think about it is that every time you remember, that's a new present. So suppose you, you, you are a five-year-old kid or a six-year-old kid like I was, and you remember your first kiss the day before. So there is a set of states in nature that was your first kiss. And there is a second set of states in nature that is your remembering your first kiss. And when you remember your first kiss, although you are accessing those original states, um, that access is modulated by the cognitive environment uh, 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 that you have when you are remembering it. In other words, it gets colored by your emotional state, uh, by the set of circumstances around you. It gets colored by other memories. It gets colored by your expectations, your fantasies. So when you are 49 years old, like I am now, and I try to remember my first, first kiss, yes, I'm going to a past state, but which past state? The first kiss or my remembering my first kiss the day after? Or my remembering my first kiss when I was 10 or 20 or 30? Know what I mean? And, and everything gets jumbled, but that, I, I don't think that that invalidates the hypothesis that uh, memory is a direct access to the past. And that's not because we are time machines, miraculous time machines that uh, magically can go back to the past. No, the past is right there, right there at all times. It's not accessible at all times because it's not evolutionarily advantageous for us to be overwhelmed uh, with everything. If there are states out there that no longer have, or that don't have a bearing on us, given circumstances, we will not remember them. But if it's useful, we do. We can access them again. So this is a bypassing of our own filters, not a magical time traveling capability of human beings. Anyway, pure speculation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael, but... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> don't, quite. Yeah, don't very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, very interesting. Thank you. And, and there is no doubt that there are brain structures that um, are, are directly related to memory access. Like, uh, you know, if you 
do damage to, to your hippocampus. You're not going to remember things. But I don't think that that's because the hippocampus holds a little right. file right. with state copies of past states. It's just something entailed in the process of bypassing the filters. It's, it's, a, it's a pathway. It's not the memory itself. And yeah, I would I point to terminal lucidity as, yeah. as uh, something that suggests that uh, memories themselves are never lost. Uh, what gets scrambled are the access mechanisms. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, thank, thanks, Bernardo. Um, you, you were saying we can go to questions next, Michael, but go for it, yeah. does it feel appropriate to share, because uh, you mentioned this question was evoked by certain experiments you've been doing recently, does it feel appropriate to share a, a summary of what they were, of like what, and and if this helps or doesn't help? And and I'd also be curious, since you're always trying to create designs, design uh, tests and experiments to nudge things in a more empirical direction. Do you intuit that there might ever possibly be a way of, yeah, testing this? And they're kind yeah. of two separate questions, but just if you yeah. want. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so it's it's uh, there, there's no there's no um, one very recent uh, thing, but uh, but the big picture, we study first in the planarian examples that uh, Bernardo was talking about, where we look at uh, different memories being imprinted onto a newly developing brain. So, in the case of the planarian, you get cut off their heads after you've trained them, and then the new brain becomes built. And when the new brain is complete, you see now that that they have access to the original information. And you could also imagine some, which we haven't done this yet, but you can imagine some very interesting scenarios where you take two planaria, you train them on radically different things, or in fact, opposite interpretations of some environmental uh, stimulus, and then you you uh, fuse uh, p pieces let's say halves of each one into a new animal that now has both memories right and so now the question is okay what is it like to be a creature that uh, that contains the opposite memories of a particular um, of a particular event so so those kinds of things and also we because we do a lot of work on a behavior in spaces other than three-dimensional space so we we look at intelligent uh, behavior in physiological space and anatomical space. This means that we can also move move memories that are not physical memories of, 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 of behavioral experiments, but memories of other things. So we can take, for example, pieces of um, and so this is this is not uh, this is not published, uh, not, you know, not peer reviewed. So you know, I, I take that with a grain of salt. But um, uh, Joanna Bischoff's work when she was in my lab uh, had to do with taking pieces from a worm that we had converted into a two-headed form by changing its uh, bioelectrical state. And you can take pieces of that worm and basically shove it into a normal one-headed host and it heals up. And that animal has some chance later of then becoming converted into a two-headed form. So that that information, it isn't behavioral information, it's morphological information, but you know, same, same idea. And morphological information can also be moved from body to body. And that representation of what does a normal flatworm look like, which is normally in this bioelectrical pattern, because it's uh, sort of, I don't know if it's fractal, but it certainly, um, you know, it certainly rescales. You can move those memories from body to body and we're doing other experiments like that um, coming up. So the, the two-headed worm, uh, you induced that without genetic manipulation, just by Correct. manipulating the fields and Correct. the epigenetics of the thing. Correct. Yeah. And then when you take a piece of the two-headed worm and you put it in the one-headed worm, the morphology of the two-headed worm can re-express itself. Correct. Yeah. And, 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 and yes. And, and so it's, it's not, a, it's not a hundred percent. In fact, it's a low percentage. It's like, I think like 17% or so uh, that it does that, but still, you know, 17% for compared Norm. to zero, compared to zero, which is, which is what normally, you know, they're a hundred percent stable, these animals. So, yeah. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think it's because we're literally moving uh, some information that, re that the cells use to remember what the heck a typical worm is supposed to look like. It's bioelectrically encoded. It's not genetic. Um, yeah. And so, and so I think my view now, I completely agree with you. I don't, I don't think that I think the neurons are in, an interpretation machinery and I have a feeling that the close, so, so one issue in the, in the memory field has been looking for the memory medium, right? Like what, what, what is the, what is the substrate of these engrams and people look at synaptic, uh, you know, um, synaptic structure, but of course those things are incredibly dynamic. They're changing all the time that that story is, is, is now starting to be, be hard um, to maintain. Other people have thought about RNA and some people have thought it was, it was protein. And, and, and various things, you know, Glantzman has some nice data with the, on RNA transfer. Uh, 
I have a feeling that, and this is just a feeling that it's going to end up being something like a reservoir computing architecture where all of the degrees of freedom of biology, not, not one specific thing, that's the medium, like here's the RNA or here's that, but like all, all of it is being used as a, as a reservoir by the interpretation machinery to, uh, to, to, to access. I mean, I'm sure that analogy isn't, uh, isn't strong yet, but uh, that's the kind of model I think we need to develop. I'm just doing the two-headed worm thing because the implications of that are are, are so profound. Yeah. Um, so, what did you manipulate to to trigger the two-headed form? Is it the chemical environment of the thing or electric fields? So yeah, so so what you can see, we we started by asking a very simple question: how, how does a fragment of a worm know how many heads it's supposed to have? And the typical answer is, well, DNA. But uh, okay, so so we said, well, but really, how <clears throat> how does it how does it know? And so when you when you look at a fragment um, using our voltage sensitive fluorescent eyes, you can see a particular pattern, and we can see we can we've decoded that pattern so that we can see it says one head. And so now the question is, okay, so what do we need to do to that pattern to make it say two heads? And someday in the future, we'll be able to say, well, I want it to be a triangle with a propeller on top. You know, that's my dream is like this complete control. We don't have anything like that yet. So, so we said, okay, how do we make it have two heads? And there's a couple of different ways you can do it. One way is to uh, give it a three hour uh, soak in a particular drug that um, opens up a particular kind of ion channel that changes the voltage, which in turn changes the pattern. The whole thing is it's an excitable medium. You know, you, you, you tweak it and then it holds, it has a memory property. So, so you do that and it has a <clears throat> it has a different pattern that says two head and that's it that pattern is now stable and those worms in perpetuity when you cut them continue to make two-headed animals even when they are no longer exposed absolutely to yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, yeah yeah the exposure is three hours after that uh you know it takes eight days to build the second head and after that for years and months you know you can you can keep cutting them and, and when you implant a piece on the normal worm that normal worm with the new piece also doesn't get exposed to the bath of whatever. correct no yes correct but that the, the the drugs are long gone no no not at all yeah so it's and, not and the stimulus and it's not the dna no cor correct and and also it is not uh, cells from the implant moving out to do to start a new head because we track them, we label them with a dye. And so you can track that there are no cells leaving that implant. It just sits where it is. Information leaves. And that's kind of cool because what you can see is, and again, uh, I say again, this is not uh, not uh, you know published yet. Uh, but what you can see is that with time, further and further regions from that implant become convinced that they're two-headed. So if you take a region that's a little bit further, if you take it on the first day, that region still does, knows it's one-headed. But if you wait a, if you wait a week, that region says, oh no, uh, but, you know, it's got a 15% chance of saying, well, I guess we're two-headed and it spreads down and down. So, so there is information. And, and I think that's basically the bioelectric circuit remodeling over time. I think, I think that's what it is. So if you, so if you call her a dye, if you call her an implanted cell with a dye, um, if that cell undergoes mitosis, does the dye go to the to the two uh, resulting cells as well? So here's the here's the fun uh, part. Yes, I, so this is great. I know exactly where you're going with this, but um, the interesting thing is that we have irradiated the hell out of that piece. There are no mitotic cells in it, and it still works. And the reason we did it is precisely for the reason that you just said, because, because there are stem cells in there <clears throat> that will give progeny eventually, who knows where these progeny end up. And we wanted to, we, we, again, it's the, the other reason we did it again is that people tend to, in planaria, they tend to really focus on these stem cells, they're called neoblasts, and everybody says, ah, the stem cells know what to do. And my strong gut feeling is they don't know. They're being told by their environment. It's not about the stem cells at all. And so that's why we just irradiated the hell out of that middle fragment. There are no more stem cells left. It does not proliferate at all. In fact, it only lives for a few weeks because without, without the stem cells, those cells will die. And, uh, and yeah, so... Michael, you're the most important person alive uh, right now. You're going to change. I don't know about that, but the game. Uh, can, can we cover this when Hans uh, visits you? Uh, can we? Oh, sorry, can we do what? Can, can we cover the two-headed uh, 
experience. we can certainly cover the two headed. I mean, the thing, the story that I just told you is um, it isn't published. So, you know, like uh, we need to uh, we need to get it out. It's been it's been a while, but but it, but but we can certainly talk about the basic the basic two headed thing. Not not only that, I don't know if you recall, there's another fun thing about the um, uh, about the two headedness, which is that we, we discovered a third. So, so there are three states. You can be a one headed worm. And you can be quite sure you're a one-headed worm. You can be a two-headed worm, and you can be quite sure you're a two-headed worm. But there's another. There's a third thing which we call being a cryptic worm. And this is this is wild. We we had these in our lab, and we didn't know about them because what happens is when we treat these animals the way that we do, uh, it it would to make two heads. It's not 100. percent So 70 percent of them become two-headed. 30 percent do not. 30% are one headed. And in every biological experiment, that's always the case. You always have something, you know, some kind of, we, we call them escapees because well, who knows, you know, maybe the skin was too thick and the drug didn't get in or something. We make up these stories that we, you know, but there's always some kind of, it's almost never hundred percent. So we had these for years and we thought they were just escapees. And then I had this, I had this amazing PhD student, Fallon Durant. And, and we said, you know, let's just recut them just to see what happens. And when we recut them, they were again 70-30. So what it is, is it's not that they're escapees. They're, they're, they're 100 percent affected, but the effect is they're randomized. And they're randomized to it. They, they toss a coin, but it's a biased coin. So it's a 70-30 coin. And not, not only that, if you cut them into multiple pieces, each piece tosses an independent coin. So they don't all agree. So some of them will be two-headed, some will be one-headed, and overall it's 70-30. Um, and so we have a paper um, with um. Uh, Gio Pizzullo, uh, who's, who's, he's a cognitive scientist, and we basically argue that this is a kind of bistable uh, illusion, like a, like a rabbit duck thing. You know, you look at it and you're like, it's a rabbit, it's a duck. So it's, a, it's basically a perceptual bistability on the, from the perspective of the, of the morphogenetic agent. So the, 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 the morphogenetic intelligence, when it's trying to read the voltage and saying, okay, so is it one head or two? It's basically a, a locked in bistable state where it can't quite decide. And sometimes it lands on the two headed and sometimes on the one. So, so, so something like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested in, in those kinds of things where uh, the sorts of perceptual, um, both the, the perceptual successes like memory and inference and problem solving, but also the perceptual failures, uh, being confused and mistaken and all of that, um, all of that happens in these morphogenetic intelligences too. So um, that's, you know, I, I like those kind of examples. I don't know whether you know much about him or even respect him, but uh, even the word you just used, morphogenetic ideas. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a biology word, but uh, the notion of feuds and, and yeah. forms and, and morphogenesis as a question of habit and memory, this is all up uh, Rupert Sheldrake's uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, lane. Yeah. Have you yeah. guys ever talked? Um, yeah, we've, we've talked, um, I, you know, as a, as a, as a, when I was young, I, I read all his books. I thought, I thought they were quite interesting. Um, I think that, uh, look if, at the, at the moment, um, everything that I just told you has, I, I think, can be explained with conventional physics. I don't think the interpretation is conventional, and I don't think the outcome is at all conventional. I think there's a, you know, there's a radical um, uh, a cognitive interpretation of all this that is, you know, basically very few of my colleagues agree with. So, so that's not conventional. But I don't use any unconventional physics. Right. So there's no new forces. There are no new fields that I need. There are no quantum anything that, that they might be there. I don't know. But 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 I, but we haven't needed them. So so that's the only thing. Right. So like I think I think um, Rupert's kinds of effects require a fundamentally new um, substrate for them. And I'm not saying it exists or doesn't. I'm just saying our work doesn't seem to need that yet. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I understand you. Uh, in an idealist perspective, um, there should be physical correlates for everything that is really salient um, mm. in nature. Mm. So you, you shouldn't need new physics because mm. um, as a metaphysics, what we are doing is an interpretation of physics. Mm. Um, and maybe Rupert suggests very strongly that there are these other fields, these morphogenetic fields, which are not one of the 17 quantum fields we have today, the electromagnetic field being one of them. So I, I understand why you're cautiously saying this. I, I think uh, yeah. it's appropriate. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm cautious because we haven't needed it. But at the same time, 
I think it's important to be humble about the following, which is that when when we cut the when we train a planaria and cut off the head, and we ask where is the information, the standard uh, response is going to be, well, then it's got to be in the tail, and probably it is in the tail. But we need to keep in mind that that's an assumption. We don't actually know that. And so, and then, you know, if not, then the question is, well, where the hell would it be? I, I don't know. And I'm not saying it's anywhere else. I'm just saying we have to be, uh, you know, clear about what we know and what we're assuming as part of our background ontology. So that's... You are you know. delocalizing biology. And that, yeah. that shouldn't require new physics because physics has gotten there 100 years ago. And it's, yeah. it's just biology that was not catching up. Yeah. Um, but th yeah. this is how you change the world um, with this this catching up with things for which we already have some kind of model of why they work at a very fundamental level, but we have resisted or not being able to apply those insights to this concrete classical reality where we live. So if you can do that, not only for quantum computers and technology and mobile phones, but with living beings, that changes the world right there. It, it, it changes so much of our understanding of what life is, of how it works, of what we are because we are living beings um, without requiring new physics. It's, I, I find this all extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the impulse I have is to pick up a, a megaphone and travel the world <laughs> uh, announcing this. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll pick up the megaphone in the only way I know, which is what's happening now with you and Hans. Yeah. Um, and normally I don't complain about our funding, but now I'm thinking, I hope we would have three times the budget. <laughs> yeah. My, my hope is, you know, my, so, so I think about this a lot, right. This, this idea of impact and, and, uh, I, I feel strongly that these kind of, uh, fundamental philosophical ideas to the extent that they're correct, they should have an impact onto in, in practical terms. And for us, that's largely, I mean, there's some other stuff, but largely that means biomedicine. And so the hard, uh, the hard task for us is to take these ideas and uh, move them to the point where, you know, what once, um, so, so Chris Field says that um, all, only technologies really resolve arguments. And I think that's, that's somewhat true, right? That, that we can, you know, we can argue about this and people can say genetics, genetics and whatever, but we hopefully someday some of this stuff will be in the clinic and then it's pretty obvious. So that's, that's my hope is, and that's, and that's really hard, right? So this is like the hardest thing we do is to take some of these things and try to um, push uh, you know, we're in model systems. We can, we've done things in model systems that were never done before. Fine. Now the next question is, can we get this into patients? And I yeah. think that will really, you know, that that's what I'm waiting for. And of course, <clears throat> the, the the mother of all carrots is that uh, it is a cure of cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because if if you can show that uh, cells can obey the global plan, even with a lot of you know uh, um, fully penetrant mutations. Yeah. Uh, then all this difficulty about you know every little variety of cancer, every tumor has to be tackled differently. Oh, yeah. Now it's off the table. Yeah. You well, don't need I... personal customization anymore. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll say two things uh, about that. One is in the frog, we've done it. So so with this was uh, you know over uh, over the last ten years, we've shown that you can take very nasty human oncogenes, which normally cause tumors in the, in our tadpole model. And if you, uh, with, with very simple and quite generic uh, bioelectrical uh, manipulations that basically all they do is they force the cells to remain connected to their neighbors. They prevent them from fragmenting. Here's this issue of fragmentation again. They prevent the cells from going off and deciding that they're either amoebas or they're gonna start a new life as a tumor. They, 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 they force them to stay connected to the rest of the network. The rest of the network knows what to do. It's making a nice liver or a nice skin or whatever. Um, when you do this, you completely override the genetic defect. And so, so you can see in the same animal, the KRAS mutation is, is, uh, blazingly expressed and, and, and you won't have a tumor because, because you've handled the physiology. So in the frog that exists now we're sort of like, so, so we've been moving on to human um, glioblastoma cells and things like that. So let's see, you know, let's see, let's see what happens. And if you remove the stimulus that enforces that, uh, do they then begin to re-express themselves as tumors? Good question. Um, in the frog model, we don't know, but but also, you know, we haven't checked it for 10 years, right? So in the human patient, who knows, right? Our frog experiments last months, not not decades. So I, so I don't know, but I will say that 
in many of but but what what gives me hope is that in many of our cases what we see is there's a there's an important memory property where we do something that changes basically convinces the group of cells to do one thing or another and that seems to stick so like in our leg regeneration pr um, project the treatment that we did is 24 hours the leg then grows for a year and a half you know 18 months of leg growth. We don't touch it at all during that time. So I can't tell you that it's going to stay stable for years, but we have many examples where we change something and then it's, you know, it keeps for a really long time. Maybe you'll have to come back and, you know, retreat. But, but there's another, there's another thing long before we did anything, the planaria themselves are telling us that, uh, that our, our, our view of cancer is all wrong. And here's, here's why. Um, you, you guys stop me if I if I did all this last time. I can't remember what I've said and what I haven't. Um, in in the, the thing about um, uh, asexually reproducing planaria is that they tear themselves in half and then they regenerate and then they regenerate and that's how you get two worms from one, right? And so the fundamental difference from what happens to us is that if if we get some sort of mutation in our body during our lifetime, your children don't inherit that mutation, and that's because the body for for us the body is disposable. The kids come from a from a you know a germ cell and everything is cleaned. All the stuff that happens to your body is basically cleaned out at every generation. The uh, asexual reproducing planaria don't do that. They keep everything, right? Because you got to, you split in half and now you keep everything. So that means that every mutation that doesn't kill the cell is expanded into the next generation. You just accumulate everything. This is why their, their genomes are in an incredible mess. And so now here comes this, this thing, which I, I find scandalous. And up until about, you know, about a, a six months ago, I didn't understand at all. Like it bothered me for years. Now I think we finally understand what's going on. Uh, how, how, so so in, a, in any um, course of biology that you t take, they're gonna tell you that your, your genome is critical for your shape, for your function, for everything else. Why then is it that the animal with the worst genome the, the messiest genome that keeps all this crazy crap that keeps that's happened over the last you know for what you know four hundred million years, why is it that they're uh, uh, incredibly regenerative, immortal, they don't age, and cancer resistant? Isn't that crazy? Why why would yeah. the animal with the worst genome have those properties? That doesn't make any sense at all. And and the planaria are telling you that no, if your genome is is full of junk, that doesn't mean you're going to have cancer. What you need is, uh, and, and this is now our, our hypothesis, is that, and, and we've done some modeling, we have a couple, of, we have a modeling um, paper that, that shows how this works. If you, if you assume from the beginning that your hardware is unreliable and, 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 and you put all of the effort into uh, the regenerative competency algorithm, and you have to, evolution has to do that for the following reason. Imagine that Imagine that you're a little bit competent. So like a, like a tadpole, you know, if, you're, if your eye is off kilter, it will find its way back to normal. Like that's what we showed a few years ago. Like these things fix themselves. Well, if, if, if you're a tadpole that comes up to, for selection and you have two beautiful eyes in the right spot, selection doesn't know if you look great because you had an awesome genome or if you look great because your genome wasn't so good, but you fixed everything. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it's, so it hides. So you see this, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an abstraction layer that hides information from selection. Selection can no longer choose the best genomes because it doesn't see the genomes. It just sees the products of the repair at the end and they look pretty good. So what, when you model this, what you find out is that the genetic improvements, the genotypic fitness flattens out the phenotypic fitness keeps going through the roof because all the effort and none of the effort is done on the structural end. It's all done on the competency. So the, 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 the few algorithms that are there to like, we know the, we know the hardware is junk, but we have to do what we, you know, do, do, do we have to somehow make this work. That's what ends up being cranked by evolution. And of course it's a feedback loop because the more you do that, the more trouble evolution has to see the actual genome because your competencies goes out. So the competency, so you get this ratchet, this intelligence ratchet, the competency goes through the roof. So I think what happened in planaria is that that went all the way, right? I think in salamanders, it's kind of like part of the way in mammals a little bit in C. elegans, like nothing because they're, you know, they're basically cookie cutter. Um, and in planaria, all the effort went into making an algorithm that says the hardware's junk, but we're going to make, we're going to figure out how to make a good worm anyway. And that is how you avoid cancer. That is how you avoid aging. And that is how you rebuild your body after somebody cuts you in 276 pieces, which is the record, by the way, for planarian cutting. It's 276 pieces. The humble planaria that I mm -hmm. feed to my fish. <laughs> Who would have guessed? They've got the answers to all of life's questions, I, I think. Yeah. 
in my aquarium. There, there's always a few in my aquarium. They never get uh, completely eaten up. If you look <laughs> carefully, you always find uh, yeah. a few here and there. This is absolutely fascinating. I, I, I could monopolize you for the rest of the evening, but I will shut up because there, there are other people here. Yeah, this is this is absolutely brilliant, and hopefully we'll have time for more more exchange. Uh, just a couple of um, more mundane things. One, someone's commenting. I'm just noticing as well, wondering if there's a a, a a piece of tape over your camera or something. You're looking a bit like a Monet, <laughs> Michael. Sorry, Sagan. You you look a bit like a Monet painting. It's a little bit uh, the the colors are a bit diffuse. I, I mean, I don't want to waste time on that. If um, that's if it takes weird. more than a second. Um, I Change. think it's just. Uh... I think it's just, I mean, it's nighttime here. And so like everything's getting dark. Um, okay. I think that's all, I think that's all it is. I don't think there's anything I can do about it. That's right. right. It, let, it's let. just the, the sensor and the compression algorithm is trying to keep as much as possible static. That might uh, be it. Okay. Um, also, I uh, failed to ask and turn on, uh, I tried it for the first time last week, this AI companion that Zoom has, if you're both okay with me turning that on, it does like an automated summary of the conversation. Fine by me. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that hopefully enables there. Um, someone was asking uh, just before we go to questions, if either of you, I just thought I'd share this really quickly because you referred to it. Is that is the rabbit showing? Yeah. Yeah. The, the yep. rabbit duck. So yep. um, yeah, just briefly, people can see how you know it's hard to put into words how we do it with perception, but you can change from seeing it a, a duck to a, the the left protrusion either being the duck's mouth or a rabbit's ears um in that context uh wondering if you can summarize or, or say a couple of things bernard especially you're saying this has huge implications uh if any of that can be translated into more layman's terms i know that's a huge ask and perhaps we just come back to it another time well um I mean, I can I can try. Uh, I, I think I think there are three fundamental um, implications of all of this. One is that to the extent that we understand how cellular collectives make decisions, our biomedicine gets better. So if we understood how collections of cells decide what shape they're going to make, then that's the solution to birth defects, to traumatic injury, to aging, to degenerative disease, cancer, all of that falls if we can communicate goals to collections of cells. So partly it's just that, it's just, it's biomedicine, that, that's part one. Um, Even lost limbs, or if yeah, you absolutely. need a new kidney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yes, absolutely. Or to take it further, and I know some people don't don't love this kind of like uh, transhumanist stuff, but I, I like it. Uh, if somebody and somebody somebody in the in the chat that wanted a second head, right? Like I I'm really a, into um, freedom of embodiment, and I think if you if you want to live in a body that has the tentacles and and you know more eyes or whatever, <laughs> you should be our, our ignorance should not be the reason you don't do it. You yeah. know, if you if you want to do it, you should you should do it, and I think someday um, that will absolutely be possible. So, um, so that's so that's kind of one thing. The other, the other thing is, uh, I, I think to to the extent that we can understand the journey in anatomical space. You know, you start as a single um, cell, as an egg, and then you travel to, and sometimes just all kinds of things befall you. Things, you know, somebody chops you in half, and now you're twins, but you're still, you know, you're you're you're, you're gonna um, if you're if you're good if you have good developmental competency, you will end up making whatever um, shape that you're making. To whatever extent we can really understand that as intelligent navigation of a space and get beyond our prejudices about intelligence being movement in you know three dimensional space, um, that really helps us to understand intelligence more broadly. And I think that helps us to understand diverse intelligence. To me, one thing that's the most interesting about development and morphogenesis in general is that it shows us another example of a collective intelligence. We know we are. We're a bunch of neurons, right, and and so on. Uh, but we see here another another type of collective intelligence that's it has memories, it solves problems, it has preferences and all of that. And so that helps us to understand what minds are, what we are. That's, you know, and then kind of the last thing, the offshoot of that is uh, has to do with um, uh, with 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 ethics and uh, uh, just um, the kind of uh, how, how we're going to relate to each other. Because uh, by understanding other minds and other embodiments and these really weird things that are not like us at all in terms of where they come from, how they are, are constructed, what their cognition is like, to the extent that we learn to communicate and, and, and relate to these things, I think it's really going to help the whole, the whole um, 
uh, it's kind of an existential thing. I think, you know, human flourishing is going to require us to get beyond these really very small differences between us and to really uh, uh, ex extend compassion and understanding to radically different kinds of beings. And so, uh, you know, the, the people talk about AI and so on. And I try to point out like, that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're gonna have all kinds of stuff that are so much harder to think about than AI uh, that are that are hybrids and cyborgs and augmented humans. You know, you think right now, some people are neurodivergent. You wait and see till they till they have, you know, crazy chips in their heads and, and you know, they're, they're, they got, you know, wheels and, and, and you know, Know, uh, tentacles and whatnot. We're we're going to be living in a in a world where uh, div the diversity of minds it explodes. And over, this is not a thousand years from now. This is a, a decade, like in the next decades. And uh, we're going to have to uh, really ratchet up our game in terms of uh, being able to relate, to, ethically relate to um, uh, other beings that are not like us. So that's, I think, the third thing that comes out of this work is that by recognizing that no intelligence isn't just these like few things that we've been studying in mammals and birds and you know maybe an octopus. It's it's a much wider thing that we need to learn to recognize. Amazing. Um, it's fun. Just briefly, I'll just share. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, I wrote a short story, kind of science fiction short story. Uh, anticipating the possibility of some of this stuff where oh we could what if all of humans could live forever and we could choose mm. our shape and you could keep changing it mm. and you know just hypothesis i mean i'm not saying this is going to happen at all but it's just interesting like imagine that well initially everyone would just choose to be as beautiful as celebrities and we'd probably go through like 50 years of everyone looking like celebrities and then that would get boring and then it would get incredibly diverse and you'd have 50 years of like crazy wonderful you know it'd kind of go through a whole bunch of different um you know the fashions <laughs> and what we look like could move as uh, as in the same way that they move it with our clothes and what we put on now um okay uh brilliant uh we're facing a brave very brave and strange new world um if it's okay bernard i'll go to some of the prepared questions uh, which kind of leave off from the last one and then if there's time uh we can go back to uh, i understood you got more curiosity and um and maybe there'll be future meetings as well uh, i hope there will be um so yeah if it's okay i'll just give a uh my best shot at a uh, recap of what we conversed last time which will also be an opportunity for um you both to correct my understanding or validate it and also update us if your thinking has evolved since we last spoke and that will lead some questions so it's just for people that may either missed it last time or it's been a while um so just recapping some of what you already said that Michael, I've understood you, I'm going to try to slow down. Some people have said I speak too fast. So I've understood, um, uh, Michael, you agree with Bernardo, the underlying essence of reality is likely consciousness, or at least you're open to that idea. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I summarize something that either of you believe is misrepresenting uh, what your position is, just interrupt me. Um, the, the, the only thing I'll say, so, so I agree with it. The only thing I will say is, um, there are things that I believe because I think we have the, like we have strong evidence for it. And then there are other things that I believe, but I can't really prove it. So, you know, I, I haven't done any work that tells us, uh, you know, what you just said. But but me personally, yes, I, I think that's right. Yeah. So you, you're, you're open to that possibility. And, and yeah, I think, I think it's that, likely correct. Yeah. Uh, and potentially in the, in the context of this conversation um, with Bernardo, it might be interesting to kind of follow into a what if of like, Again, taking into account what you just said, that you, you, you don't have absolute certainty. Um, but in the context of that model, then what would appear to be individual minds, like you and me, we could think of as temporary apparent dissociations of a whole. Um, and the metaphor that Bernardo uses is like a whirlpool and a lake of water, um, which is not made of a different substance from the rest of the lake and is not separate from the lake. But the activity of whirling, which we call a whirlpool, is separate from the activity of the rest of the lake. Um, and uh, just just checking, Michael, if you agree that in that context, what we call perception, sights, tastes, smells, and colors, would then be representations of what other mental processes look like from across these dissociative boundaries. In other words, when one whirlpool uh, is impinged upon by another or perceives another. So, yeah, I think... So far, well, so, good? Uh, so, so, so far, so good. I mean, again, to be clear, like I we have not uh, made too many claims about consciousness per se and and things like that um uh, so i want to be clear that uh, whatever, everything i say here is just kind of personal um speculations not anything that i say is uh, you know strictly shown by us 
Um, I think that it, it re really is important to uh, think about what things look like from a third person versus first person perspective, because everything looks different. Uh, you know, the questions of questions of uh, freedom of self at all, all that stuff looks differently depending on whether you're looking at it from out, quote unquote outside. I mean, there really isn't any outside, but, but, but from, from the temporary outside that, that we see as third person um, science and, 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 and philosophy versus being the system itself. Yeah. Is there anything you want to comment there, Bernardo, before I move on? I'm, I'm kind of happy sorry. with it. Yeah. Okay. I know how much you wrote, so I don't want to delay you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, try to try get to the question. I just think the context, re restating the context will be helpful. Um, so, again, in that context, Michael, that you're not making claims that you've proven this or shown that, uh, but you have different intuitions, you and Bernardo, as to what we have good reason to believe, again, using this language, uh, uh, discrete dissociations or individual minds um, and Bernardo believes that the most likely candidate uh, from a third person perspective are li living organisms with metabolism and I've understood you Michael to say you suspect that the number of systems in the universe that don't have an inner perspective are vanishingly small and if I understood your most recent blog piece could even include algorithms yeah, yeah, uh, that's uh, c c correct. So I I see it as a continuum, um, and I think that uh, all sorts of very minimal things have little proto experiences, and and uh, as of uh, recently, uh, now you know intrinsic goals that are not in fact uh, determined by their algorithmic structure. So, yeah. Okay, pretty well. Did, did you catch that one, Bernardo? By any chance, uh, this one on the algorithms. Uh, no, I didn't read the blog post. Um, just a quick comment. Um, I, I think the number of systems in nature that that uh, do not have an inner perspective is exactly zero. The question is, where do you delineate the boundaries of what constitutes a system? I think mm -hmm. the systems are all life, each living being is a system, and then all the rest together is one system. So in other words, there is nothing that doesn't have an inner perspective um, where uh, I might uh, have a more, I don't know, uh, extreme, <laughs> less flexible view than Michael is that uh, I I'm not categorically saying that uh, there are no non-living systems somehow separate from the rest of the inanimate universe that, uh, that have a, a, an inner perspective. I, I cannot categorically state that. I don't know. My point is, we don't have good reasons to think that um, inanimate systems that are delineated by us through a kind of projection of linguistic, linguistic structure onto the ontology of nature, um, we don't have good reasons, I think, to think that non-living um, organisms or inanimate uh, uh, things that we have a name for, we don't have good reasons to think of them as a thing separate from the rest in some way. Um, uh, for instance, uh, to, to start with an obvious example, where does the Atlantic Ocean end and the Indian Ocean begin? Or the Indian Ocean ends and the Pacific Ocean begins? Now, everybody agrees with this, that this division between oceans is merely nominal, it's linguistic. It's just names we give for, for segments of nature that are not separate things at all. Um, and it gets a little more difficult when we start th talking about the river and the ocean, <laughs> but it applies there too. Where does the river end and the ocean begin? And in my thinking, you can extrapolate that to everything we call an inanimate object. In other words, there are no inanimate objects. There are only subsets of pixels of this one holistic big image that we call uh, the inanimate universe. So, And because of that, then I resist saying that... Um, that my mobile phone is a system, and therefore that we can have a discussion about whether my mobile phone has inner life or not, because I would then deny the ontological existence of the mobile phone as a thing distinct from its surroundings. Yep. Uh, I would accept uh, uh, the idea of a mobile phone only for uh, convenience reasons. Like you have to give a name to something you want to buy, uh, but that something is not a system. It's it's just an arbitrary carved out segment of a bigger system, uh, the inanimate universe as a whole. So, so, so I actually am completely in agreement with that because I think that uh, 
the ability of some systems to establish these boundaries themselves and to differentiate, you know, this autopoiesis where the system itself tries to figure out where do I end and the outside world begins, that's critical. So systems that don't do that, I, I agree with you that, uh, that that's, a, that's a very important, uh, I, I, I still, I would still say it's not zero for those kinds of things, but that's okay. That's a minor thing. Uh, I agree. What, what they need to do is to, is to autopoetically establish their own boundaries. And if they don't like the ocean, or like some of these other things, if they don't work to establish their own boundaries, then uh, there's not much to, 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 you know, to it from the experience point of view. Um, however, uh, I, you know, most people associate that with life. And uh, yes, on this planet so far, mostly that's what we call life are things that do that. But it seems to me that we're not that far off from knowing what the criteria are. And I think autopoiesis is one. I think there's a couple of other things. And I think we could make things that do that, that are not traditionally alive and yet meet those criteria. I, I have no objection against that. As a matter of fact, um, I see no reason why that shouldn't be possible, why human beings shouldn't be able to induce a biogenesis, for instance. Uh, yeah. But uh, what you're suggesting is more than that. What you're su suggesting is that... Uh, that we could induce dissociation in nature without it even being a metabolizing organism. And I have no in principle objection with that um, either. Um, if you are the one putting this forward, I would be a lot more friendly uh, to you because of all people on the planet, you probably understand what the underlying mechanisms are. Most people who say, well, AI silicon computers should be conscious. Why not? Right, right. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and you see, and, and, and that's because my life, most of my life now, hopefully next year it will be a little less, but most of my life now is sort of um, uh, outreach, uh, public engagement. Uh, I get that a lot, that yeah. people mistake <clears throat> uh, the linguistic structure of their thinking uh, with the ontic structure of nature out there and they project yeah. the structure of language onto nature and they take for things stuff that isn't a thing at all or we have no reason to consider it uh, a thing yeah 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 i think i think that makes perfect sense and uh you know there's two there's two ways that we go we can go wrong one is uh, to to attribute uh, those kind of properties to today's architectures, which don't meet any of these criteria. But the other thing that I see as a problem is that when people become convinced that they don't meet the criteria, they then assume that that well, that's it. Then this is it. You know where they take <clears throat> they take today's uh, the, the technology, which the, you know uh, let's say LLMs or whatever that doesn't that doesn't match these actual criteria. They say, well, then that's it. That you know these machines, you know, will never be conscious. I'm like, uh, the, these machines won't. But <laughs> you know, the, you know, you can't you can't you can't think that this is this is all there is to it. And in fact. Um, I started uh, a few months ago, I started writing a paper that uh, clearly tried to delineate what the necessary ingredients are. And then I stopped and I don't think I'm going to write it. Not that that's going to help somebody else will find it. I think, you know, other, other people will, get, will, will find it. But, but, but I, I stopped because I, to whatever extent it's correct, to that extent, we're going to end up making uh, beings that have moral worth. And I'm not talking about being afraid of them as what they're going to do. I'm talking about, um, um, you know, mis mistreating things that actually can suffer. And so I, I didn't want to really want to be responsible for a trillion new, you know, beings that... Uh, whatever so um so, so somebody will somebody will find it but but i agree with you that modern uh, current implementations don't do any of the things that are needed for this and it, it goes deeper a lot of computer scientists who who don't understand computers by the way computer scientists are power users of computers mm. and m most people think computer scientists understand computers and no they have never been close to a computer they operate on layers and layers and layers of abstraction operating systems apis libraries all kinds of things um, but the, the the key problem I see um, with this, it, it's beyond transhumanism. It, it's about sentient AI. Uh, the, the big problem I see with that <clears throat> movement, a lot of people talk about that as if it were like, uh, well, of course, right? It's completely plausible. And you have Black Mirror on Netflix promoting that kind of stuff. 
creates a manufactured sense of plausibility for it. But the key problem is that me people mistake a simulation for the thing simulated. So uh, I I'm sure that's not how you are thinking, but I will come up with a hypothetical example. Suppose you, you lay down the criteria very clearly and the criteria are correct. What a typical computer scientist would then do is say, oh, I will build a simulated model of a thing that meets Micro's criteria and I run it on my server farm and lo and behold, it will thus be conscious. Mm. No, <laughs> because uh, uh, code running on, you know, uh, control and data paths uh, according to a von Neumann architecture, uh, that's not meeting the criteria, even though it is simulating a thing that could meet the criteria. And it's the, the, the metaphor I like to use. You, know, you can simulate kidney function accurately down to the molecular level on your PC. That doesn't mean that your PC will pee on your desk because the simulation is not the thing simulated. And that's my worry, that because computer scientists live in a world of layers and layers and layers of hierarchical abstractions, that's what they do. That's, that's their profession. Yeah. That's what they are taught since they enter college. Um, they have become unable to distinguish the simulation from the thing simulated and to think in more plausible, concrete terms as opposed to going so far as to say, well, guess what? The whole of nature is a simulation. Then you have philosophers like, like Nick Bostrom making a living and burning taxpayer money doing um, uh, what, what, what is that? the whole, uh, whole juridical system about how to treat the simulation and the ethics of the whole thing. And I go like, oh my God, this is how cultures lose themselves to abstraction. They lose touch with the reality. They take off and they go to Mars and they or Saturn and they never come back. And they think the earth is Saturn. But yeah, so I have a beef with that. Uh, because these are people close to me. I mean, although I'm a computer yeah. engineer, my PhD was as much computer science as computer engineering. So I'm close to, to that world, and I see this stuff happening there, and I, it's frustrating to me. Sometimes I think I, you would really, yeah, I, I think you would really enjoy, um, I can, I don't have the link on me, but I'll send it around later. Um, the work of uh, Richard Watson uh, at, uh, at, in the UK. So he's a computer scientist, evolutionary biologist. He and I have done a bunch of stuff together, but he's really recently uh, abandoned functionalism completely and uh, is really, I, I think, I think you would, you would really like what he has to say. What was the name again? Watson? Richard Watson. Yeah, I'll send. I'll send around. A, I'll send around a link. Yeah. I don't, okay. I, don't I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 I think you get a big kick out of it. Brilliant. Um, so this might just uh, kind of bring it down to more more lay terms. Um, so I've understood from what you've said and the papers I've read that you you feel like we shouldn't just make claims from an armchair that we should be testing uh, which systems have intelligence and which don't by setting up obstructions to whatever goal we perceive them trying to achieve and seeing if they can arrive at the same goal by different means. Um, but can we, and maybe this relates to this question, I might just be repeating it, which means you might be able to rephrase it in ways that I and others can understand. Can we empirically test um, for where that intelligence resides? Um, and are there empirical criteria, so speaking to what Bernardo was saying, about where the boundaries and legitimate divisions of a system are? So uh, I'll give you an example, which will help me. I've understood you to posit that I have an individual mind. You know, I can learn lessons and have goals and intentions, as do potentially my organs and my cells, which will have discrete uh, goals and behavior spaces that I can't access, even though I depend on them. And, uh, and they can't access mine, even though they depend on me at some level. I think like cells can live for some six hours after a human dies or something in, a, in certain circumstances. Um, but how do you, can you empirically delineate the boundaries of, say, a liver and uh, in a way that you wouldn't be able to do for a, a hand, for example? So I, I don't think you're claiming that we could also say, oh, a hand might have its own lessons, even though I can teach. Um, well, I'll, I'll, the example that I thought of is um, if you talk about looking at what the practical implications are, how I relate to a system, if my right hand learns not to go into a fire and burn, I don't have to reteach the lesson to my left hand. My whole system is part of one conscious system. So like, I understand my right hand learned the lesson, my left hand's got it now too, and my feet and the whole rest of my body. 
but that's slightly different from if I learn to eat with a knife and fork and my right hand knows how to use the knife, my left hand knows you know fork, and if I try and swap, it doesn't work so well. They both could kind of be delineated as different systems, right hand, left hand, but the lessons don't cross over um, as equally. And what got me thinking about this was uh, in that last blog post, you said, oh, so people immediately, the objection they give is like, oh, if mind is everywhere, then you're saying that, you know, the weather might have its own mind. And you counter with like, well, I don't know, but you'd have to test it. Have you ever tried to train it? And let's say you were, were to manage to train the weather to behave in a certain way. How That comes back to the question I was asking, how would you know where the intelligence resides? Is it in the, let's say you train the weather system in England, is it separate from the weather system in Scotland and Wales, you know, which are right next to it? And is it just the hand, but the system that knows that is a larger system? Um, how would you separate the weather system from, of course, all the other factors of which it is inherently a part? Um, so yeah, that's a kind of big chunk of a question, but. Okay. Um, well, let's see. So, so there's a, there's a lot there, a couple of things. Uh, the, the first thing is that, um, uh, the question about uh, you and your hand is really an empirical question because for an octopus, the tentacles actually do have their own stuff going on. And they, uh, the octopus is a much more distributed system. The, uh, the limbs have their own goals that sometimes uh, match the goals of the, the central goal of the octopus and sometimes they don't. And so for humans, that's probably not the case. But the thing is that this isn't something we decide from a philosophical armchair, we do experiments. And the way you can, the way that, um, so, so one step back is, is Remember that I am not yet, uh, I'm not trotting out a full-blown theory of consciousness here to compete with others. I'm talking about um, cognition that is useful for people to do experiments and, and so on. And so what, uh, what I say is that we now have tools. Uh, some of these are uh, things like causal information theory. Some of these are Fristonian um, active inference. So there's a bunch of other you know, mathematical tools that we can use to ask where is the most fruitful place to draw the boundary? This is purely empirical. If you decide to draw your boundary at your wrist, my question is going to be, well, where does that get you? For a human, I'm going to guess it doesn't get you anywhere. For an octopus, you would be best place to put it right up where the where the uh, tentacle meets the the you know the central body. And when I say best, what that means is it affords you best prediction and control. So these are all testable things because when when any of us when any of us see systems, uh, and this is kind of like what, um, what what Bernardo was saying, we, we are taking an IQ test ourselves. We are saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hypothesize some kind of problem space that you're working in. I'm going to hypothesize what your goals are. I'm going to hypothesize what the size of your cognitive light cone and where your boundary is from the outside world. And I'm going to hypothesize what your competency is. And then, and then we get to find out how good your hypotheses were. If, if you look at a brain and you say, wow, what a marvelous paperweight, like, great. And then somebody else says, now nah, you missed the whole point. It does all this other stuff. Uh, well, then we get to find out who's, whose model was, was better and, and how much intelligence there really was. And, um, and that's, you know, that's, that's my point. And so, so when, when you and I are having a conversation and you say that, um, you know, you, you're, you don't have access to your liver, you don't even have access to your right hemisphere. If, if, if you, like most people, are, have language in the left hemisphere, your right hemisphere has opinions that you have no idea about. And if we were to put some sodium pentothal in one of your carotid arteries and ask your right hemisphere, which doesn't talk, but it can write, and ask it to write some stuff down, you would be pretty shocked at what it would say. Because this has been, this has been done both in split brain patients and, and you know, people with temporary um, uh, when they put one of the hemispheres to sleep, it's got all kinds of stuff going on. It has opinions uh, which, which you know, don't match yours and so on. We, we, they've had cases where the one side was religious, the other side was a total atheist and said it's all bullshit. Uh, you know, so, so we have to remember that as, you know, when we say we, you know, we are talking, it's pretty much our left hemispheres having a, having a conversation with each other. And people, um, uh, you know, uh, people like uh, Giulio Tononi have tried really hard to, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not talking about his theory of consciousness per se, I'm talking about the, the computational work that he's done to, because he's, he's basically, um, he and, and uh, Eric Hole, who used to um, work in my center, they've developed a, li literally a tool, a mathematical toolkit, I mean, it's Python code at this point, that you can apply to data to say here is the best place to draw the boundary, and 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 that's an empirical uh, thing that then holds up better than other boundaries. So that's that's you know that that's my claim about the functionality of it. I I resonate with that a lot. IIT four is a great advancement over 
IIT three, even over IIT two, it's like a world uh, of difference. Mm -hmm. And I think the the what do they call it? The it's not the isolation, the exclusion principle mm. of IIT of the five principles is the way to conceptually model dissociation. Mm. Um, I, I think that's that's the way to go. And and, and I do think we have a lot of in, internal dissociative boundaries. We are dissociated from the mental process that corresponds to liver function and kidney function because those can be autonomous and it's evolutionarily better that they be autonomous. Um, and it could be that if you apply IIT4 and you have enough data about some seeming system in the inanimate universe, I don't know, a sun with its electromagnetic patterns you know, of ion flow and, and how the fields behave, if, if we could have perfect fine-grained metrology about all that, because that's the critical thing about IIT. If you don't have the input, you don't have the output, and you, we always have to make simplifying assumptions because we don't have perfect metrology. But if we could have, in principle, perfect metrology and we would apply it to a system like the sun, which is so loosely coupled with everything around it, it could be that the exclu exclusion principle would tell you, well, there is something it is like to be the sun, maybe not as critically dissociated as we are, because the more a system is internally associated, the more information it integrates internally, the bigger the chasm between it and what is outside. So even if you have an IIT complex um, that because of the exclusion principle, uh, you can say this is a complex on its own. There is something it is like to be it. Even then, if that complex is not integrating a lot of information, then it's 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 um, fault lines in IIT jargon. Its fault lines uh, are not very strong. In other words, it it could quickly reintegrate if something happens, because there isn't enough information integration within it to sort of uh, throw to cast a shadow on everything else, to, to obfuscate everything else. And obfuscation is, is, is a metaphor I used in an old book, uh, Why Materialism is Baloney, 10 years ago already. And, and IIT formalizes that idea of obfuscation. Even after you already have a complex, the more information that complex integrates, the harder it will be for it to make sense for that complex to merge with anything else. Because its internal information integration obfuscates everything else. It, it integrates more information um, in most cases than if you would attach something to it. You, you'd create a fault line if you attached something to it. So I think putting that together with Carl Friston's notion of Markov blankets and active inference, because the Markov blanket is the boundary, right? Uh, that yeah. If you can find those intermediary set of states, you found the boundary of some sort, you can do that for life. So could you do that for something else? So that IIT and your uh, Varelian uh, uh, autopoetic, autopoiesis, uh, autopoetic, yeah. right? That's not autopoetic uh, um, idea. And what your understanding of biology, I think if we put that together, uh, if those people who know what they're talking about came together and tried to sort of think this through, we throw them in a small island for a week, like I was thrown into <laughs> this year, um, I would respect what comes out of that. What I don't respect are computer scientists with a big mouth and a lot of religious belief who do not understand computers and do not understand biology, making all kinds of statements about sentient computers that I do not respect. They are too close to my own world and uh, it triggers a sort of a immune reaction for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and the last uh, kind of uh, the last bit about the, um, the training, right? So, so why do I focus on training? So, so remember, this is not a theory of consciousness. This is a theory of cognition. And part of uh, one of the tricks that uh, puts you on the spectrum of cognition is uh, being able to learn, and in particular, being able to learn things that none of your parts can learn. So, so when you Let's have a interrupt rat... with a yes/no question, yeah, sure. You can have cognition without consciousness. 
I, I'm not going to say you can, okay, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say you can have zero consciousness. I don't think that's probably possible. But uh, what I will say is that um, I, I don't have anything terribly smart to say about consciousness per se yet. So I would rather uh, stick to what's worked out, what I've worked out. The consciousness thing is coming at some point and I'm happy to engage on it, but I haven't, it's not mature yet. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, don't, don't, don't listen to anything I say about it. Um, but, uh, but, but for the cognitive, but for the cognition part, um, part of what gets you on the spectrum is um, having uh, it be, being able to learn uh, things that your parts can't learn. So, so I'll give you two simple. I'll give you a canonical example and then a, a radically um, unconventional example. The canonical example: you got a rat. You teach the rat to press a lever and get a delicious reward. The reason you have a rat and not a pile of cells is that no individual cell had both experiences. The, the cells that interacted with the lever were the skin of the feet. The cells that got the delicious reward were the cells in the gut. No individual cell had both experiences, and yet somebody owns the um, associative memory that the one leads to the other. Well, who owns that associative memory? And you've got the cognitive glue. You've got this electrical network that actually allows them to know something that none of the individual cells know. So that, that's a, you know, that's, that's a, a canonical example. Here's a, here's a crazy example. And this has to do with this is almost as crazy and maybe equally as training the weather. So if you look at a model of a gene regulatory network, this is just a bunch of nodes and the nodes we, we write down this one turn, you know, up regulates that one at a certain rate and this one down regulates that one. And, you know, you, you connect them all. And this, these are the kinds of things that um, we know control various aspects of health and disease and development and everything else. These are molecular pathways in your cells. Uh, you look at that thing and you say, and, and if, if you don't have my crazy perspective on it and you just kind of think, you know, what's going on, you look at it and you say, well, it's fully deterministic. It's completely transparent. There's no magic here. There's nothing else going. I, I can see exactly everything this thing can do, um, and therefore all the the only tools I have are the tools of dynamical systems theory. And and people treat it that way, and they can sort of um, you know figure out some behaviors and so on. So we looked at that and we said. Well, I don't know that we, we know everything that you can do. Let's find out. Let's, let's start using the tools of behavioral science. And one of the simplest tools of behavior science is training. So can I, uh, can I treat you as if you were an, an organism? Treat some of the nodes as input um, as senses, some of the other nodes as uh, responses. And I'm going to look for habituation, sensitization, associative conditioning, prediction. Um, okay, so, so we, have not, we have not yet demonstrated prediction. We have not yet demonstrated autopoiesis. So I'm not going to say this thing, you know, is a thing within their perspective, but we found six different kinds of memory, including Pavlovian conditioning. So this is something that uh, nobody had seen before because it was, it was blatantly obvious that something as dumb as this couldn't do that. And so I, all, you know, what I argue for is, is uh, a little bit of um, uh, humility around the fact that we really don't know how to predict cognition well. And just because the weather seems dumb, doesn't mean that if you had the appropriate level of uh, stimulation that you could do with, I don't know, you know, heaters and temperature, who knows what, what the hell you would use. But, but I don't know that you wouldn't find simple uh, beginnings of, um, of, of cognition, for example, um, uh, uh, associative, associative conditioning. Right. You might find, in, in fact, I've asked them, you know, sort of half joking. I asked uh, some physicists at one point, you know, when you take a proton and you and you jiggle it in the magnetic field and you do that a thousand times, the, the jiggle on the thousandth time, is it exactly the same as it was on the first time? Like, is there any, like, is there any chance that there's some kind of hysteresis here that it's got some sort of, you know, where past experience actually changes the way it be, reacts to stimuli in the future? Could there be some sort of, and, you know, and, and so some people said, you know, no, of course, that, that's impossible. I'm like, I don't know. Have we checked? So um, all, all I know is we are not good at recognizing intelligence in unfamiliar embodiments. And that means we need a principled, I actually think this is one of those things that behaviorism got right. I mean, it got many things wrong, but the one thing it got right is that it doesn't care what your substrate is. There's a framework. Here are the things that you can test for. And, uh, and I don't care what you're made of. We can still test those things. And if we found it in gene regulatory networks, boy, uh, I would not be shocked if we found it in the solar, whatever, in the weather. I'm not saying it's there. That's the part, that's the other thing. So, so I get, I'm, you know, I know I'm going to get people that email me. I knew it. There was, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a spirit behind every, every rock. I'm like, no, you can't assume that either. You have to do the experiments. That's that, you know, that's my claim. If I, if I can just share a comment with you, Mike, I mean, this does not apply to you. Your thinking is much too nuanced, uh, uh, 
for this. I, I don't you don't know you very well, but I know you well enough to know this. Uh, but um, th th there is in, in the world of you know mainly computer science, uh, there is a fallac fallacy that is obvious. If I would explain with a metaphor, but um, it gets lost to people. For instance, um, if you see a, a mannequin on a shop window, that mannequin in many ways is isomorphic with a human. It has a head, has two arms, has a body, nose. And, and, it, and then because it looks like a human, you would then say, this is my hypothetical scenario. You would then say, well, if it looks like a human and humans are conscious, then the shop mannequin should be conscious. Now, the, the, the fallacy here, of course, is to forget that the shop mannequin was made to look like a human. It didn't arise spontaneously out of nature looking like a human. If that had happened, okay, now you may have grounds to say, well, if two things arise spontaneously in nature and they look like one another, maybe their underlying inner processes also look like one another. This is reasonable. But when you construct one to look like the other, then you have no grounds to use that isomorphism to infer mm. anything because yeah. it, it was constructed that way. Now, it's the same error that people make when they say, well, chat GPT sounds like a person. Right. So chat GPT is conscious. No, it sounds like a person because it was built to sound like a person. It's, it, it, it's a language interface. Um, uh, so it was built. So you have no reason to think that it's conscious for the same reason that you don't have reasons to think that the shop mannequin is conscious. Um, you mentioned hysteresis. You know, th there are chips built for hysteresis. There is, there is a very common chip called the 74HC14. Uh, it consists uh, of uh, six inverters uh, with hysteresis inputs. That doesn't mean that it's that it, it's an instance of autopoiesis. It, it, it was made to have hysteresis Correct. because hysteresis is a good noise insulator. Um, so, so that's my concern. Uh, my concern is that at some point you will write that paper um, and you will be right. And then this paper will be abused because people go and say, well, I will build a system that fits exactly those criteria. Like you will build a mannequin. And then I say, look, it exhibits those criteria just like a human being does. Well, of course, you built it for that. You see, that's my perennial concern because I see our culture running into this fallacy all over the place, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I, th I think that's correct, and I'm not claiming that any of these things uh, have uh, we, that we have evidence for autopoiesis in these things. Although we're looking, so who knows where the heck we would find it? I you know I don't know where, where we'll find it. But um, but on the but on the cognitive side, uh, it builds up from very simple atoms of uh, of, of things like, uh, like habituation, sensitization, anticipation, associative learning, and eventually, you know, you start to get to, to more advanced things. And and we're just not very good at recognizing them. So that's what I, I that's that's my my the only my insistence is that um, we're, we're humble about how how bad we are to just make you know, make assumptions about these things. My, Michael's, I think, just got a few more minutes. Is it okay to, no, normally we have more questions from participants, but um, obviously we're, we're running out of time. Uh, is that okay just to get one audience uh, question in? And, sure. um, or Jason, so uh, as always, I, I can read uh, someone's question or um, if you want to unmute, you can ask it yourself. Uh, feel feel free to follow up, Jason. I'll I'll just read it because we're la lacking in time. Michael, can you clarify the causal relationship between bioelectricity and morphogenesis? Uh, where are the patterns stored? How do these patterns emerge in the first place from a single zygote? Um, okay. And if you could give a two sentence translation for anyone that hasn't, I, I don't know if that's possible. So, uh, well, uh, I, I see. I see. Work so far. Yeah, uh, I see. Th th there are three questions. Uh, three questions, really. That the first one is is the easiest: uh, the causal relationship between bioelectricity and morphogenesis. Um, bioelectrical networks are part of the uh, uh, cognitive medium in which the collective intelligence of development operates. In other words, they store the memories, uh, they underlie the decision making, um, uh, the things that that collective intelligence needs to make 
to to do its to do its navigation. It has to well, morphogenesis is a navigation process. It's a journey in anatomical morphospace, space, just like uh, animals journey through three dimensional space, and just like. Uh, in neuroscience, you see how the neural network, the electrical networks in your brain help you navigate um, three-dimensional space in exactly that way. The, in, in fact, that's where it evolved from is all cells using electrical networks to navigate a different space, in that case, morphospace. space. So the information in these electrical ne networks guides the large scale uh, morphogenetic outcomes. That's the causal relationship. It drives the uh, what the collective is going to do, what it's going to build, how it repairs the damage. Anyway, that that's the causal relation. Um, so where... I just translate because I, I didn't know this three months ago. Morphospace is like the head knows to be here and your arms know to be here. The kind of shape of the organism. Um, yeah. Let's uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give yes. It's 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 all it's the space of all possible configurations of the anatomy. I mean, there's a million different ways. You know, you can you can ima imagine every possible uh, seashell. There are three parameters that give you every possible seashell. So you can draw a cube with these three parameters, and every point in that cube is some kind of seashell. The flat ones, the pointy ones, the you know, uh, that's morphous space. And of course, for something for a more complicated organism, it's it's a hugely dimensional. It's a high dimensional space. Um, okay, where are the patterns stored? Uh, they are literally well. Uh, they, they are literally stored in the stable electrical states through the network. So if you look at, and we now we've developed uh, we, we, the, the tools to, to the, the methods to actually see these electrical states. So you look down onto the tissue and you see an electrical state and you're reading its mind. You are reading the mind of that collective morphogenetic intelligence. If you know how to decode it, which frankly, we only know in a few specific cases, this is the work for, you know, for decades on. Um, but in those cases, we can look and we say, ah, I see you think uh, a worm should have two heads, or you think a worm should have one head, or you forgot to, you forgot about the eye that's supposed to be over there or whatever. So, so that's, that's where they are. And then the last question is how do these patterns emerge from a, from a single zygote? You can watch it happen in the frog embryo. It's great because it develops from a single egg right in front of you in a Petri dish. So we have videos. I, you can literally, in, in some of our um, papers and on our website, you can literally watch a video of it happening. So what happens is there's a single cell. That single cell has a bunch of um, bunch of ion channels, which these ion channels let ions in and out, which lets it um, do, you know have basic electric circuit behavior. When the cell starts to divide, the symmetry of that uh, of that um, uh, excitable medium is broken. Some of the patterns come from uh, uh, what they call symmetry breaking and emergence, like Turing patterns. Think like uh, you know spontaneous patterns in a well mixed uh, chemical solution. So some of them are emergent. Others are driven by other events in the embryo. So some of the channels go to one side, some of the channels go to the other side, and that creates a voltage gradient that then says, "This is my left side. That's my right side." And things like that, and then they just get progressively more complicated. There's um, there's another piece to this which uh, is really really um, uh, uh, kind of uh, you know far out there, and we could uh, if if you're into it, it has to do with uh, platonic space and things like that. Um, I have some thoughts on this. If if you want to entertain such stuff, uh, we could do it. Uh, you know, we could do it at a future time because I can't do it now. But but you really get to the there's a there's a there's a, there's a kind of there's the hard as always there's a hard problem and an easy problem like like Chalmers says the hard the easy problem is to look at an embryo and look at the physics of exactly how the patterns evolve, you know evolve over time and yes okay we can we can do that and we can see how it works and that's fine the more deep more interesting problem is in a in an informational sense where did they come from and typically what you say for any uh, animal or plant is you say well, eons of selection, of course, uh, because because everything else died out, and and of course that that's where it comes from. Now it's got that's fine until you come to xenobots, anthrobots, and other things that have never existed before. There's never been selection to be a good xenobot. There's never been selection to be a good anthrobot, and various other synthetic things that people make. Where do those patterns come from? And so I have some uh, completely wild and unsubstantiated uh, thoughts about that that we could uh, we could talk about. But but that I think is an even more interesting question. Although for the medical side, of course, you have to track down the molecular um, steps. I think I speak for most people in the group that uh, yes. we enjoy the wild and unsubstantiated uh, <laughs> propositions as much as the ones that are really cool. rooted in the uh, in the test. Yeah, um, there was uh, a there was a. Uh, secret meeting once uh, yes yeah, secret it, meaning it's not announced it's not open to the public it's invitation only and, and uh, the theme was 
everything everything you think is right but you can't prove <laughs> that's cool that's a good people meeting. come together to only do that for two or three days <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good meeting um michael just such deep gratitude one more, more time and uh people won't have seen it in the chat necessarily but michael says he'd he, you know there's more questions and he's willing to come back which is sure. thrilling for, from my perspective and yeah, always fun um, yeah we have another series with bernardo i think pr most likely in march but we might be able to do another one off before if, if you're available um and equally i'm wondering i could email you this as well um Certainly I would benefit, and I'm sure others would as well, uh, kind of being walked through some of the basics of, of your research. And I know that you're very busy and just putting it out there that maybe you have a, you know, a colleague or a PhD student or, you know, someone who really understands your work who can maybe want to do a course and some of the basics uh, as well. Or maybe that's already happening and you could let us know and people could kind of catch up and follow some of the more high level things that you're presenting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will. I'll, I'll check around with my folks. Um, I am supposed to be, uh, I've got a whole list of a, of a very, like an in-depth uh, series. It's going to be, I don't know, probably seven hours or something that takes everything very slowly, step by step. Because usually I keep like, you know, in an hour talk, I keep, it just flies, everything flies. Um, I, I don't know when that's going to be ready, but I'm happy to introduce you to some folks in my lobby. If they want to come on, um, then you'll have, you know, you'll, you can, you can get them to, um, I will, I will uh, put one other thing on the, on the chat, which is this. So this is um, unlike uh, my, my main website which is drmike11.org which that's where all the like uh serious stuff goes that i'm pretty sure of this here is a new uh it's a blog where i sort of put some other stuff that i'm not necessarily sure of so if you want to hear uh you know harebrained speculations and a bunch of other weird stuff uh, some photography and whatnot that's where but but so now what i do now is uh, for 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 significant papers um i will always do a post that goes with the paper that explains what's interesting and it has all the stuff that they make me chop out of the papers because inevitably with these, with the, and I, now I know, you know, most of the time I don't even put it in, but, but that's been my history over, over the last few, you know, three decades is that you send in these papers and eventually they say, okay, fine, we'll publish it, but you got to take this or that out. It's just too, you know, it's too wild. And, and so all of those things now end up here. So if anybody's interested, there it is. Uh, just to say, I've subscribed to it for the last few weeks and yeah, it's brilliant. So yeah. Um, very quickly if, if michael still has a couple of seconds michael when when I, i'll explain what this is afterwards to, to the other people when hans visits you uh, our policy and if you want we can put this in writing uh, our policy is that uh, you have uh, veto power on the final edit and you have decision power on timing of publication or even if it is at all published or not we, we can put this in writing the, the, the reason i'm sharing this with you is that uh, you, you can we would love you for you to be absolutely to feel absolutely free uh, in that mm -hmm. conversation and even if there is stuff that you don't want out yet because it hasn't been published or peer reviewed no problem we can we can record can the stuff and then you tell us okay now now it's okay show me the final edit and i'll tell you what you have to change or whatever i'll give you the date so we can do that and you, and if you want you can put it in writing as well it's no problem Got it. That's yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. As long as I mean, I'm happy to do that. I, I will just, you know, be very clear. I, I, I try to be extremely clear about what is a uh, finished product from from my lab that uh, people, you know, stand behind and what is just my own harebrained thinking that I don't expect anybody to, you know, sign on to. So as long as I can be uh, very clear, which is which, then we're good. Yeah, you can you can always just tell Hans, I want you in your editing, I want you to make that distinction extremely clearly. And then you do that and you send it to you and you can say, no, no, you didn't do it clearly enough here and there. Sure. I mean, with Chris Fuchs, we went through like three interactions before the mini documentary was good to go. And, and Chris had absolutely detailed feedback on which word should be in and which wow. should not. We are used to this and it's okay. Uh, it, okay. It's what we can do differently from a commercial um, media organization. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, great. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Bernardo and Amir. And thank you all so much. Um, yeah. Really appreciate uh, the questions and yeah, good discussion. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you for being here and doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. Until next time. See you all later. Yeah. If anybody needs, uh, you can always email me, but um, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Happy for holidays. Me. Such deep yeah, gratitude. You too. Yeah. You too. Happy holidays. You too. Yeah. Thank you. Bernardo, are you... Um... Happy to stick around a little bit, or sure. you, I know it's yeah, I already had dinner. You, okay. <laughs> you, you did <laughs> maybe you'll regret mentioning, um, uh, you, you stay up until 4 a.m. sometimes, but we won't do that to you. <laughs>
Um, Joe, do you want to... Um, sorry, I saved your question because it was about analytical idealism for... Hey, so we had a two-hour Q&A with Bernardo after this call, which you can access at adventuresinawareness.com, as well as signing up to join the next call with Michael and Bernardo coming up in March. We've got a growing community here of meditators, mystics, scientists, and consciousness researchers, and would love for you to join the conversation.